webinar tonight organized by the KCL Center for Ground Strategy. My name is Flavia Gasbarri. I am a lecturer in the Department of World Studies at King's College. And tonight I have the uh, great pleasure to chair the presentation of uh, Dr. David Martin John's new book entitled uh, History's Fools, the Pursuit of Idealism and the Revenge of uh, Politics. Uh, in our panel to, uh, tonight, we have, of course, uh, the author of the uh, book, uh, Dr. Jones. Let me just briefly introduce him. Uh, Dr. Jones is a honorary reader in the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland uh, and visiting professor and teaching fellow in World Studies uh, in the World Studies Department at King's College uh, London. Uh, he has extensively researched and published uh, on the international relations and political development in East and Southeast Asia, on terrorism and political violence, supplied history and political uh, tools. And uh, tonight he's of course presenting his new effort, uh, uh, the book History is Fools. I'm also very glad to have here in the panel and to introduce you Professor uh, Michael Rainsborough. Uh, professor Rainsborough is Professor of Strategic Theory and is the former head of the Department of War Studies. He's an expert of strategic theory, the nature of war and the hidden aspects of warfare and on the history of strategic uh, tools. And Professor Raysboro uh, will be the discussant in uh, tonight's uh, conversation. So I am very much uh, looking forward to start this uh, uh, event. Um, but before we can start, let me just remind the uh, public that the video, this uh, event, this webinar, is streaming live on uh, YouTube and it is also recorded to, so it, um, it will be available uh, on YouTube uh, afterwards. Um, we will now listen to uh, Dr. John's presentations and then uh, Professor Raysborough's comments and then we will open the uh, floors to uh, questions and comments from uh, the uh, public. Um, if you want to ask questions you can use the uh, Q&A function. There is a um, little uh, um, section at the, at the bottom of the screen. So please um, post your uh, comments and questions there and I will read them loud to uh, the uh, speakers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll leave the floor to uh, Dr. Jones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fl uh, thank you Flavia, for that introduction. Um, I'll talk for about, I don't know, 15 minutes, I think, on um, what the book tries to do. Um, so the book attempted to synthesize what has happened since the end of the Cold War, an exercise in how worldviews form, sustain themselves and disintegrate, leaving those who embrace them sifting around the wreckage for something to cling to. Coming to the end of my peripatetic career, which began as the Cold War ended, King's offered the opportunity to reflect on what had happened in the cosmo to the cosmopolitan agenda of global order founded on democratic norms and its legacy for Western thought and practice. In this enterprise, I was able to draw upon a number of my own writings over a 30 year period, some in collaboration with others like the good Professor Rainsborough and John Bu, who um, also I collaborated with when I was at King's, to elaborate, the, the, the process was to elaborate how what Michael Oakeshott, under whose aegis I began my postgraduate career in the late 70s, termed a rationalist style of politics, and how that informed an understanding of what the collapse of the Soviet Union meant for global order and the progressive end to world history. This teleology was, I argue, a form of magical thinking. It saw order both national and transnational as the product of a determinate independent ethical instrument. Taking a long view of the future and a short view of the past, the evolving progressive mentality had the ultimately debilitating effect of misrepresenting the West's actual predicament in a reality that actually disclosed a, a variety of possible paths following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Somewhat problematically, it had identified only a single homogenous line of development, which is 
as I quote from Oakeshott, to be found in history only if history is made a dummy upon which to practice the skill of a ventriloquist. The ventriloquism, however, was persuasive. It appealed across the political spectrum, as well as to the media and big financial and business conglomerates. It was a, men, a McKinsey executive, after all, who gave us the borderless world. And even after 9-11, and despite the long wars of choice that the US and its coalition partners embarked upon, in part to bring about democratic regime change, it sustained its appeal to a cosmopolitan transnational elite. The book traces how the prevailing idealist norms of a progressive democratic order achieved economic and political salience. Its structural postulates emerged from the collapse of the Soviet system, the apparent end of ideology and the triumph of market capitalism. As Thomas Friedman, more than Francis Fukuyama showed, the golden straitjacket that ensured growth and development required globalization, the electronic herd, open markets and open democratic societies. Yet even at peak optimism for the end of history, a number of skeptics pointed out that rapidly rising Asia might be different. This notwithstanding, the postulates of globalization and their correlation with enhanced economic growth via an interconnected world, best achieved through states that liberalize, integrate, and pool their sovereignty through regional and international arrangements, facilitated a new progressive ideology for a post-historical order. Interestingly, this evolved from previously recondite theories that deconstructed Western thought and practice in the 1980s. The return of grand theory, as Quentin Skinner identified in the 80s, set the theoretical agenda for constructing a new world order framed along progressive and idealist lines, emanating from a radical reevaluation of Kant and the Enlightenment project. It also reflected a reawakened academic concern with public ethics and theories of social justice and group rights associated with John Rawls, Charles Taylor, and Ronald Dworkin, amongst others. This North American liberalism coincided with a growing European interest in a Frankfurt School understanding of universal emancipation and cosmopolitan transnationalism. The emerging discipline of international relations theory, combined with a third way in governance to embed this utopian project as an enduring influence over public and international policy. Seduced by the empty kisses of abstraction and assuming all problems available to a communicative reason, the progressive mind subsequently dismissed objections to the promotion of its modernization agenda framed around multiculturalism, group rights, devolved sovereignty, and an international community based on shared norms as at best irrational, at worst racist. Given its universalist pretensions concerning the shape of the emerging world order, the emergence of Islamism post 9-11 in its encounter with the borderless secular West crystallized the illusions that beset the progressive mind in its endeavor to establish an inclusive order freely obeyed. The persistence of a political religion that should have adapted to the prevailing inclusive but secular worldview occasioned a series of intellectual and policy contortions. Several chapters consequently evaluate the political and ideological equivocations that ethicist universalism engaged in to accommodate the fact that secular modernity had become amenable to a political religion to use Eric Berglund's term, that adapted to its tolerance in order to advance an alternative non-negotiable eschatology. Somewhat problematically, the third way of counterinsurgency prosecuted this violent ideology abroad, but treated some of its transnational leaders at home in the West as either misguided or mentally deranged. Progressive and inclusive politics at home 
whilst progress prosecuting a war on abstract terror abroad, seemed increasingly un incoherent rather than enlightened and tolerant. The practice of the mainstream media, academe and governments, whether of a conservative or social democratic hue, to sanction any criticism of this policy of tolerating the intolerant, only added to the incoherence of the cosmopolitan vision. The Orwellian application of terms like Islamophobia and radicalization further suppressed open debate. The misuse of words as Camus added in a different context added to the sorrows of the world. The long wars of choice damaged the progressive project, but by no means proved fatal. The postulate of this idealist project assumed, after all, that progressive globalization had answered the problem of both equitable economic growth, global order, and major interstate conflict. Open borders, independent central banks, and light touch regulation would end the economic cycle of boom and bust. The financial crisis of 2008, rather than the war on terror, undermined the structural foundations of the third way. The consequence of the global shock to financial markets saw the emergence of a new precariat class in the West and a burgeoning divide between a cos cosmopolitan elite committed to some version of pooled sovereignty and international institution building and an, alien, an, an alienated mass who experienced the crash, leaving them anxious and abandoned on an alien shore where ignorant armies clashed by night. Financial collapse restarted history. It had a series of consequences unforeseen by an Olympian teleology. In the West, pressure for the return of the nation state, rather than their reduction to member state status, fueled outbreaks of nationalism everywhere. Brexit, Trump, and the rise of populism across the West were the outward and visible signs of an interior struggle for the West's soul. Despite the cracks appearing in the transnational progressive edifice, Tony Blair could claim in his autobiography in 2010 that it still set the agenda. A decade later, this was not the case. The last chapters of the book then explain how this change from global optimism to Spenglerian decline evolved. Internally, the democracy promotion agenda, always less than convincing to Asian technocrats, faltered, destabilized by the internal polarization of democratic party politics. Externally, the return of geopolitics and the rise of the revisionist powers, especially a China that refused to be a responsible stakeholder in a US-led international institutional order, further exposed the gulf between the idealist rhetoric and the quotidian practice of international politics. The book suggests that to address this weakness, the West might return to a more prudent politics that constitutionalists from Machiavelli to the authors of the Federalist Papers first promulgated, rather than the pursuit of abstract norms and global justice these might better suit our interesting times. Machiavelli and Hegel might be more appropriate guides to statecraft than Kant and Habermas. The crisis of Western dem democracy, rather than demotic hysteria, requires a reasoned politics of balance, a middle, not a third way. To mediate the modern pursuit of universalist schemes of progressive perfection, Prudent skepticism should recall government to its perennial office of, of preserving order relevant to the current conditions of society, restoring in the process both the balance of attention and a balance of power. Of course, this time it might be different and Western democracy is the most successful form of rule in the 20th century might not recover. The conclusion observes that enduring political metaphors like the body politic serve to warn of the diseases that cause constitutional decay. Body politics 
sorry, body politics, like their human equivalents, suffer and die. Even seemingly healthy bodies, as Ibn Khaldun and Thomas Hobbes diagnosed, can fall prey to internal disease, external shock, and of course, more recently, microorganisms. Empires, regional orders, and kingdoms vanish, and far more frequently than is generally recognized. At the same time, the rise of government by algorithm is in the process of transforming both the economy, building a new form of capitalism without capital, and rebuilding ourselves from autonomous individuals, from the autonomous individuals to our, our factors in an algorithmic equation. And the autonomous individual, of course, was so important to the classical liberal project of democratic accountability. Rule by AI programmers offers the ultimate triumph of the style that we first identified as rationalism, that engages in schemes whose ends have always been determined by their end. Oakshot warned that chagrin ultimately awaits all those who embark on such enterprises. I'll stop there, Flavia. All right, okay. uh, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation and for all the kind of controversial uh, points that you uh, raised. Um, uh, Professor Raisborough, please, I would uh, yeah, thank you, immediately Flavia. to your, to your uh, comment. Thank you. thank you, David. Thank you, Flavia. Thank you, David. Um, I want to keep my remarks uh, pretty brief uh, because um, David is the main event and he's obviously given you a, a very good summary of, um, of his uh, new book. Um, so I'm just going to confine my, uh, my uh, comments to so one or two sort of general thoughts. The first of which is to, um, uh, and I have, I have read uh, David's, uh, David's book from cover to cover. Um, and uh, have um, you know, and I went through it, and I uh, began underlining um, all the things which I thought all the very good points uh, which he made, and I uh, realized that um, I should really sort of um, use my marker to underline all the um, all the parts which um, were not relevant because or, or were not uh, didn 't have something to say because there are very very few of them so um, my my book is actually literally sort of etched with um, you know almost every pages etched with, um, uh, with uh, a, a marker pen. Um, so he makes, I think the, the, the strength of um, David's um, book is that he uh, brings together an incredibly impressive um, array, or, or he manages to synthesize an incredibly impressive array of, of very, very sort of, uh, um, sort of complex international um, and political and philosophical um, ideas. And manages to sort of unify them in his book in a in a very very sort of a, you know, profoundly sort of um, insightful manner, uh, which actually tells us really about how uh, we that is we if you want to call it generic West have kind of ended up in our rather deracinated condition. Um, so I would just like to sort of reiterate how much um, value I think resides in. Uh, David's book, and I think it um, it also um, it is also very important because um, it is in quotes um, controversial. You know, controversial not because um, I think David says anything which um, does not make um, in many ways um, entirely logical and and profound sense, but um, because he cuts against the grain of I think what um, some of us um, uh, understand is a so deep um, consensus um, within particularly the discipline that we might call um, international relations and it's a wider so it's wider studies in whatever you want to call it international political economy um, um, broader political science ideas and so forth um, which um, uh, given the uh, the um, anti-realist um, orientations of um, a lot of uh, a lot of thinking in these kinds of disciplines today um, means that David's book is essentially a kind of um, an outlier in a lot of the works which um, which are currently produced under the aegis of um, of international relations. 
um, but which actually deserve, um, I think, as a result, to be even more um, closely read because it does question and critique a lot of the pretensions which have arisen inside that discipline and indeed which have, as David argues, um, have actually influenced um, uh, policy, policy decisions. And I'd just like to conclude my remarks by um, emphasizing what I think of the uh, deleterious impact on, um, on policy which um, the rise of a political and intellectual edifice which um, is uh, imbued with utopian um, ideas and often convinced of its own moral rectitude has actually wrought in the policy sphere and hopefully it won't be too difficult for many people to um, think back and to understand um, what some of those um, policy failures um, have been um, arising out of a, a conviction that, um, that, uh, um, that moral um, goodness actually resides in a, in a self-proclaimed policy elite, um, which has given us, um, particularly in foreign policy terms, we can also see it in domestic economic terms as well, as David also mentions, but um, in foreign policy terms, it's, it's very stark, you know, with the, um, with the number of um, completely misguided and deeply costly, um, some would say illegal, um, a lot of people would also say deeply inhumane, um, ultimately, um, interventions which have taken place in, um, in areas where um, the uh, interve intervening powers of the West have uh, didn't did not have any understanding, or didn't didn't have much understanding, or an appreciation of of any kind of uh, long term follow through of um, what the what their implications would um, would end up um, wreaking, which, as we know, has been the disintegration of um, a number of societies, particularly in the Middle East. Um, uh, has resulted in the destabilization um, of, um, of countries as diverse as uh, Libya, um, Iraq, um, etc., Afghanistan, sometimes having knock-on effects in producing um, uh, large migration flows which have also further destabilized um, parts of uh, southern and eastern Europe, but also extending into further parts of Western Europe, which then, surprise, surprise, produces the blowback um, that, um, uh, that these policy elites um, uh, uh, have um, complete disdain for. So, you know, like Brexit, like, like the rise of um, Donald Trump in the United States, like, like the rise of so-called populism in, in Eastern Europe. Um, well, you know, if you want to know the causes of these um, of these events, well, maybe the these people who these global idealists should actually look in the mirror because they themselves are responsible. I would suggest to a greater degree. So, um, what um, the rise of um, this sort of utopianism um, in the West, which David David's book has amplified. Um, I think speaks to um, a way in which um, you might say that um, uh, the um, a prudential um, approach in foreign policy terms in the West has been lost, and uh, which has allowed you know this generic idea of the West um, to actually be outplayed um, and outthought um, uh, in terms of um, approaches to. Um, extant foreign policy concerns, be it in the Middle East, um, uh, be it in South Asia um, and elsewhere. So, um, you know, you, lo and behold, you get um, uh, the West seems to be um, consistently outdone by um, Russia, by the likes of China, um, which seem to assert their interests, often in a very brutal fashion. Let, let's be um, let's be open about that. You know, I don't think anyone necessarily wants to see the uh, Western powers, um, you know, become like those powers. But nevertheless, the um, the detachment from um, from that sort of prudential approach in Western foreign policy, I think, has um, exacerbated numerous numerous problems and diminished uh, Western influence. But above all, I think the emergence of a very utopian uh, or the the pursuit of idealism. Um, 
uh, in, um, in Western foreign policy um, and the rise of this um, ethically informed um, progressive global cosmopolitan approach has resulted in the detachment of this policy elite from an understanding of their own societies. You know, so um, they have a, uh, a disdain for, a disregard for um, the populations within their own, uh, within their own polities, you know, which means that in the end, they, um, if you don't understand your own society, then probably you're not in the best position to actually give good policy and strategic advice. Because as, as Clausewitz said, and I'm a, um, a student of, uh, of, of Karl von Clausewitz, um, um, one of his phrases was, was that in order to make a good strategy, you had to understand the temperament, and he uses that word, the temperament of your own people to understand the passions and feelings at play. And if you basically corral um, policy making within the self-invoked um, morally sort of uh, um, uh, this, this self-arrogated um, moral idea of, of how you conduct yourself, conduct foreign policy, then of course you're going to detach yourself from any understanding of the temperament of the people um, of your own society. And once you've done that, I think you lose all claim to, uh, or certainly you lose um, a substantial right to claim that, that you are acting in the best interests of your own society. And so let me, let me leave it there. I hope that's given you a few sort of sidelights on what I think are some of the sort of broader policy implications inherent in David's book. All right, uh, thank you very much for adding further uh, food for thought uh, to this discussion. Um, uh, David, I don't know if you want to add anything before opening the floor to uh, the questions that are already arriving. Hello? David, do you want David? to comment? Mm. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I thought you were asking Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, I was asking you if you have any, any, anything else to add or to respond. Well, no, no, we'll just go to q and I think. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, both of you, we are, uh, we are already uh, receiving questions. The first one is from Martin. Uh, who asks uh, how much of the Western post-Cold War strategy is deliberate and consistent with genuine consideration versus the accidental policy decisions of direct democracy like Brexit or populism, Trumpism? Right, okay. Well, yeah, I can see the, the, the point. Um, I would have thought, um, you know, if we're tracing over the long durée of uh, 1990, 2020. I mean, policy since 2016 has been rather more capricious, uh, one could argue. But prior to that, um, you know, the, the third way in governance, both, you know, locally and globally, seemed to have a fairly consistent attitude internationally or transnationally to what it was sort of seeking to achieve, which was by various means, a democracy promoting agenda attached to the idea of um, uh, economic growth um, and internationally institutionally built order that would um, promote um, not only an ethical foreign policy, but a, an ethical uh, order which uh, emphasized regions and um, international arrangements rather than states as the key actors in world politics. So I think there was, um, you know, up until uh, Blair at least, um, a, a, a fairly coherent view of what international policy, especially for the US and the UK, should entail. Um, since then, um, uh, no, it's probably been more inconsistent and more uncertain. And our current uh, predicament um, is, is where we are at at the moment. All right, thank you very much. And Mike? No, I, I don't want to take up any more time from the, for the question. So I broadly, uh, broadly agree very much with what David says. I think, I think that's exactly right, that uh, 
Um, you know, and again, just emphasizes what uh, hopefully what I was trying to say in my own comments, which is that uh, there was a, um, I think, a discernible, um, what you might call broadly Western tradition of uh, uh, movements in, in foreign policy, which um, certainly post-1997 has largely been lost and has, has produced um, you know, a lot of the damaging policy outcomes that we are currently contending with. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from Mark. Uh, the vision of the ideological transnational policymakers has been undone by the excess uh, by the excess of pragmatic neoliberal economic policies. To what extent were these two worlds linked? Um, hang on, look, I can't see that question at the moment, um, um, which is quite a complicated one. Can you? <laughs> okay, wait a moment. I. Uh, Oh, hang on, it might be here. It's okay. No, I've got, I haven't got that it? question from Mark, no, for some reason. Um, David, oh, hang on, I've I? I found it, it's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, well, so the, the question then, if I would rephrase it, is that um, the open market policies of um, uh, the post-Cold War um, uh, uh, economic uh, policies, which were, to use that awful phrase, neoliberal, well, I, um, did they uh, undermine the, the transnational policy vision? Well, I'm not sure. Um, there seemed to be a curious alliance between um, the idea of, a, a, or, or my, my argument would be in response to uh, Mark's point, um, I would view it the other way around, really. The, the, the success of market states in, in the 1980s um, in uh, being, or seeming to be, the only way of developing modernity along um, economically more equitable lines. They might, um, you know, states that wanted to develop after, fr from, the, well, from the Cold War onwards, might start off as authoritarian, but in the process of development, they would have to produce, or they would, inevitably um, give rise to middle classes who are increasingly educated and who would want the goods of a more liberal, not necessarily democratic society. But implicitly, the emergence or the attraction of market economies or market states uh, globally facilitated the transformation of Asia, particularly uh, those Asian countries who were open to the West during the Cold War, South Korea, Japan, the Asian tigers, the uh, Asian dragons, all were um, receptive to this so-called neoliberalism, which was the basis of their development. It was also, it would seem, the reason why the Soviet Union collapsed. So the consequence is that liberal economic policies were the foundation for what then comes as an idealism out of it, which, you know, with um, Habermas or Giddens, wants to um, make capitalism more attractive, more friendly. Hence the idealism builds out of the economy, not the other way around. Um, so if you like, there's a bit of um, structural Marxism here to uh, facilitate the discourse. That would be my point in response. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Duha. What has been the number one pushback in terms of academic thought to the ideas posed in your book? Um, uh, <laughs> the, um, sorry, I'm just... Um, uh, sorry, I, let me see that question again. Um, okay. Um, I, I think the, the, the main 
issue of pushback is, is that um, uh, the problem with academia as it's developed as a managerialist and um, grant getting um, approach to, to knowledge and with it the perhaps decline in some standards that apply to entry has meant that increasingly academe has become um, orthodox in, in its um, uh, presentation of knowledge and its maintenance of research. Hence, um, the lack of uh, space for alternative views, um, particularly, I would say, um, conservative views um, has been quite notable um, since uh, universities became businesses again from the 90s onwards, I would suggest. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mike, uh, do you have anything if you want to, to uh, no, um, jump in? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I, 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 I just uh, completely agree with David on that. I think he summed up very well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the uh, next comment from Terry. Uh, but the Asian tigers uh, and I uh, see were not followers of neoliberalism. Their economic growth was driven by state-led and non-democratic regimes support, uh, supported especially by the United States. No, no, I, I, no I, that's fair enough, Terry. But the, the point would be that um, their state-managed growth actually was accountable to market forces. In other words, you know, you could say they, they um, you know, the, the Asian model, which, you know, I, I kind of discussed quite extensively in the first chapter of my book, was interestingly an, an ability to take aspects of um, liberal economics and filter them through an Asian values model that meant that a kind of state capitalism or what comes to be known as an authoritarian capitalism was made feasible and it was made feasible of course by the open conditions of the western markets that enabled Japan, South Korea and other countries to rise as I can actually put it like a flock of flying geese. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Christopher, uh, uh, are we not confusing or at least mixing up uh, end and ways? Ends might be idealistic, but the ways must always be realistic. The means must be what we can afford in both Doshin capital and political capital. Um, well, I don't think so, Christopher. I mean, I, I, I see what you're, you're, you're getting at. Um, uh, but I, I would have thought the, the ideals are always um, within the, the means that um, are, are being promoted. So, of course, um, the, the, the problem, well, the, the way I would present it is that um, as states develop as they become more wealthy as a result of globalization they of course want um, more than just material uh, well-being they want other things the the idealist agenda has to have wealth to make it run i would say Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question from Mark. Uh, how far was Blair merely resuming the long tradition of Western interference? For example, Iran in 53 or Suez in 56, or Vietnam, Korea, uh, etc. Um, yeah, well, he, he not only re resumed it, he, he put it on steroids, I'd say. I would, I would just uh, add on to that. Um, yes, please. Um, yeah, that... Um, uh, I mean, in, in, in one sense, yes, you can say that uh, Blair, uh, Blair's wars, so called, they, they do exist on some sort of continuum. If you want to, um, if you want to see the perspective as one of Western intervention, on the other hand, as, as David implied, um, what uh, well, what you could say about those uh, those particular those particular you know wars pre um, pre you know pre uh, pre the end of the Cold War is that they were informed either by a desire to protect Britain's 
imperial interests um, and or they were done um, with some idea of protecting broader Western, Western ideas of anti, anti-communist interests. You know, so there was a sort of a clear sort of ideological um, uh, sort of you know, goal um, point to a lot of these inter- interventions. And also, um, you know, if you're thinking about, um, uh, I mean, obviously the Britain didn't intervene in Vietnam, but you know you could say that uh, um, Britain's um, so-called wars of colonial disengagements—they were they were pretty sort of realist orientated encounters, which were intended really to leave behind pro-British regimes. You know, and also where the British um, felt that they, that the situation was too complex, say um, in Palestine or um, a good one would be the Yemen in the, in the late 1960s or mid-1960s, um, um, the, the British kind of got out, you know, or, or didn't, even, didn't even decide that the fight was worth it. So there were very much of realistic premises based on sort of calculations of, of what could realistically be achieved. Um, what, uh, what Blair's um, uh, sort of wars, you know, you know course it wasn't just him, of course, it was, it was a broader sort of Western coalition, was based on sort of explicitly sort of ethical um, ideas, you know, um, making the world a better place, or if you want to be critical, bombing to make the world a better place, you know, and I think that is, that is the difference and that is the controversy inherent in them is that, you know, the basis for intervening, you know, there may be, you know, the, the aims might be all well and good, they might be based on, you know, wanting to do good, but in the end, what has been the result? Has the, has the end for those sorts of societies actually turned out very well? Well, you know, I think the, the broad conclusion is that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, I don't want to take a pick, Ira- Afghanistan, Iraq, um, uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, um, um, uh, Libya, um, so on and so forth. Um, well, uh, I don't think the um, the, adva- the scale of advantages and, and disadvantages weigh very heavily um, on the advantage scale. I think the, those encounters are brought on policy, elite policy advice. Yeah, and um, so I think we can make our judgments accordingly. Yeah, just to um, uh, uh, Mike's point is absolutely spot on, really, uh, about the Cold War uh, relative realism compared with the post-Cold War uh, democracy promoting, you know, agenda of wars of choice rather than wars of necessity. And it's quite, you know, like the point about Vietnam, I think, is, is, is an interesting one. You had a pragmatic Labour Prime Minister like uh, um, uh, Harold Wilson and a very prudent foreign minister when he wasn't in his cups in George Brown, um, that could contrast very dramatically with, with Blair's um, in, internationalism, really, and his um, complete um, kind of uh, addiction to um, an in- interventionary agenda, which didn't really suit British, British interests in the long term. Thank you very much. Another question from uh, Will, who asks about the Biden administration, who's uh, uh, coming, um, and asks how um, can the United States correct the zero sum excesses of the Trump uh, years, especially vis a vis uh, an increasingly assertive and capable autocratic China? Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the way in which the um, uh, the Trump regime collapsed uh, is, is um, uh, hugely problematic for Trump's legacy. On the other hand, um, some of the um, uh, foreign policy decisions that Trump took, um, in other words, you know, America was not engaged during the Trump regime in any um, uh, interventionary exercises overseas. Um, and with regard to China, um, I don't think uh, it's as, you know, Trump's policy 
is uh, a zero sum excessive, uh, as, as Will maybe, you know, thinks. Um, certainly, you know, there was a case um, that um, Trump rather uh, uh, capriciously abandoned the, um, the what was the Trans-Pacific trade um, proposal that, that Obama, late Obama regime was, was, was promulgating. Um, but in other areas, the fact that um, China had been really since Kissinger treated as uh, a power that could be shaped um, and could be a responsible stakeholder in the international community that gave China considerable advantages, not under Trump, but as a result of um, Bush and Obama, the second Bush and Obama, China's entry to the WTO, the, sorry, the World Trade Organization in 2002, uh, supercharged its growth. And it was not accountable to the kind of liberal constraints that the WTO should have imposed upon it. And so Trump's attempt to um, question China's trade policy, I think was entirely reasonable. And actually, you know, if Biden and Kurt Campbell have any sense, they would build upon it rather than necessarily trash it. Thank you very much. Another question, second question from Mark. Uh, free markets are undermined by monopolistic structures and where people and organizations operate behind tax systems. Has a new global establishment been created as a result? And if so, what does this mean for democracy? Well, I think, good question, Mark. Um, I think the, um, you know, mon monopolistic structures are indeed, um, problems uh, for not only people and organizations, but for democratic growth, transparency, and accountability. And um, um, I don't know whether a new global establishment has been created, but certainly um, post-COVID and post-financial crisis, we've created a hell of a you know, financial debt arrangement that it seems unlikely we're gonna get out of in, in the immediate future without some very hard decisions being made. Um, I don't know that there's not a, I don't, don't see a new policy establishment. Actually, I see a lack of an establishment really. And, and the G7 and the G20 offering very little. Right, thank you very much. Another second question from Marty. Um, it seems to me that since the Cold War, uh, the, there has been a significant delatching of foreign policies from defense policies in the West, uh, which may be a strategy on its own. How much has separating the influence of military strategies um, affected our current Western vulnerability to more militarized approaches to strategy? Maybe Mike can answer that, actually. Um, <laughs> well, um, yeah, no, no, thanks. It's, a, it's an interesting question, if I, if I understand the, um, uh, the terms of the question right, Marty, that um, it certainly is, is the case that, um, and I speak for sort of, um, or, or sort of my um, thinking is based on um, you know, sensibly British understandings, um, but I think they apply more broadly um, across Western Europe and even the United States as well, which is that um, as the breadth of the interventionist tendency arose, um, defense spendings were actually reduced as a per capita of uh, GDP. So I think that does, um, as your, uh, maybe uh, I think your question implies that that produces, well, a, a fairly sort of obvious and logical tension between your uh, your means and your your capabilities, which I think is a very um, potent source of uh, the current incoherence in um, uh, broadly speaking western western foreign policies if your aspirations are to um, are to be interventionist, then of course you must um, be willing to um, service that uh, that that capability both in terms of means and most importantly of political will 
And so, um, and I think we can see again, so far as the sort of uh, an understanding of British foreign policy is concerned, how um, incoherent this 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 made British foreign and defence policy in the aftermath of the. Um, uh, toppling of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, whereby um, you would have thought or you would have hoped, I mean, and uh, David and I uh, remember this um, period very well um, in, in 2003. Um, and um, speaking for myself, I think for David as well, you know, we were thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe if there is something in this, um, in, the, in the whole idea that Saddam Hussein has, uh, um, has a nuclear weapons capability or an evolving capability and maybe um, maybe it was correct to go in and, and uh, intervene and topple Saddam Hussein. Um, but regardless of whether it was or wasn't, you would expect that the intervening powers, of which Britain was, was perhaps the second key um, partner, they would actually have a plan to occupy the place, you know, rather than just regime um, you know, topple over the regime and hope the hope the society will somehow remake itself in some sort of um, democratic image. Um, and the fact that um, both capabilities and will, you know, result, you know, the, or the lack of them, um, resulted in the complete failure of um, Western and certainly British policy in in Iraq um, through a completely incoherent um, occupation policy, I think, underlines the verity of, of what you're saying. And if we extend it into, um, say, you know, the intervention in Libya, again, knock over a regime, um, you have no interest in, in, in the means or the will in following it through and, and um, seeing through a, a, a uh, government, um, you know, which, which could um, be, which could survive in place of Gaddafi. Um, you know, arguably, you no know, one shouldn't have actually intervened in the first place, but nevertheless, if you've chosen to do that, then of course you must have the, the means and the capability. And I think that um, you know, the chickens uh, definitely came, came home to roost as a result of, the, of that um, delatching um, that you refer to, M Marty. So yeah, I think it's a fair, fair point. Thank you, Mike. Um, another question from Aaron. Uh, how much are we in the world uh, living with the hangover of the end of the bipolar Cold War in the West? Yeah, I, I think what Aaron's asking is that um, the Cold War in the West conducted, because the, the, far, the rest of the question is, is versus Nixon decoupling of the bipolar East i.e. China and the Indo-Pacific shift. That's a balance of power. power. Um, well, if, if I kind of um, understand the question aright, is it that the West um, uh, is itself, um, well, the West always saw the Cold War in terms of um, the Soviet Union and China as a bit of an add-on. Um, and actually, the the uh, the end of that, um, and the shift um, in the Cold War mentality, or, you know, that Europe could expand uh, eastward, um, ignored the fact that um, China, uh, which was treated in, you know, as a result of Kissinger and Nixon's opening, in an entirely different way and enable China to emerge as a far more um, effective threat, particularly economically, to the West uh, than, than the Soviet Union. Um, that seems to have been, um, in, what could be increasingly seen as a, something of a mistake. So Kissinger, the great uh, Cold War realist and pragmatist, is always a bit, um, uh, uh, elusive in his view of China or as something that is uh, obviously a major civilization, but something that can be brought within a Western orbit. That was always the dream after 1972. Uh, Nixon himself was a bit more skeptical uh, before he died in an interview with William Friedkin. He actually noted that he might have created a Frankenstein's monster. Um, this is the, um, you know, one of the potential legacies of that kind of um, um, shifting politics towards China, I think. 
And the Indo-Pacific now becomes a region not only of opportunity, but also potential global conflict going forward as the Chinese and the Soviet, well, the Russians um, particularly now realize. Great, terrific, thank you very much. Um, I think we are uh, almost, the time is almost over. Uh, before concluding, if I can just ask briefly a question to David as well, because uh, you mentioned 9-11 and then uh, uh, the economic crisis in 2008, which under certain respect, as you said, had even more influence and impact. And now we are living uh, into, uh, in the middle of a health crisis. And I expect in 10 years, probably the next one will be an informatic crisis and then probably the planet will explode and the world will end. But my question is, um, if the current crisis uh, will have any impact on in, in basically uh, pushing things in the direction you, you described in your, in your book? Well, yeah, my... I mean, I, I think, um, you know, the, 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 we're talking about the, the COVID effect, yeah? Yeah. Uh, and what that um, implies going forward. Um, I suppose, you know, obviously I wrote the book before COVID yeah, hit. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Came out in April uh, and uh, devastated my attempts to promote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm very against microorganisms at the moment. But um, I think, the, you know, the not only the um, disease itself, a microorganism, you know, that has um, uh, devastated um, our um, economies in, in the West. Um, uh, and so it's not just the micro, it's not just the, the, the coronavirus. Um, we've dealt with coronaviruses in the past without this um, medical health kind of um, approach to disease, the public health state that we now live in, um, where we're ruled by our, our kind of um, iatrogenic concern with, with health at the expense of our economies. Um, uh, this seems to me to be uh, potentially tragic, actually. I mean, when I wrote the book, I thought there was scope for um, democratic recovery. You know, I mean, we've become a bit over the top about the potential for a universal end of history. But, you know, our aspirations for a liberal order were, you know, noble. Um, you know, we might have gone around about, about it slightly wrongly, or wrongly, uh, in the long term or the sh relatively short term. But the, the idea of international order, complete peace and harmony are, you know, good um, uh, ambitions. Um, and democracies might have got overstretched and the, uh, over promoted certain things, but there was the potential to, um, you know, prudently recover and, and reboot the democratic project. Uh, the economic devastation that we've wreaked upon ourselves, which China has, has not suffered from, even though it would seem to have created the virus, um, is, you know, uh, one of the great ironies of the current condition, I think. I mean, China's recovering very nicely, as we're all in, across Europe into a third lockdown. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic, not, not because of the coronavirus itself, but our response to it, which has been so illiberal. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for answering my question. Um, time is over, unfortunately, so I have to wrap up. I want to thank our uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Johns and Professor Raysborough for this fascinating talk. I would like everybody to join me in a virtual round of applause for our uh, panelists. Uh, thank everybody for your attention uh, and your participation and for your questions. Uh, this um, event will be available on uh, YouTube on the World Studies channel, um, I think tomorrow, I mean, as soon as the recording uh, is ready, so you can re-watch it. And I thank everybody uh, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. You can stay on.